And you have been listening to film composer Dimitrios Katus from Greece. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for being here. It is a pure delight to have Nia Vardelis with us on its rainmaking time. She is the author of a new book called Instant Mom. And I want to tell you a little bit about her. First of all, she asserts that she is not a grown-up, that there is nothing done that love can't undo. She is a Tupperware addict of galactic proportion, and she cannot sit at a cafe by a manicure pedicure place as the mere thought of the sound of a toke being clipped will drive her insane. She loves musical theater so much that she thinks she might be a gay man, and she cherishes real friendships. For those of you who would like Nia to come with you to pick out a dog, don't do it because you may end up with a coyote in your house. Ladies and gentlemen, it is propitious that we are doing this interview with her at this time during Wimbledon. It is a royal event. In fact, Nia is a Canadian Greek exotic goddess. And the Queen of England invited her last year to the Jubilee and leaned over to her and asked her, did she write my big fat Greek wedding? She has curtsied to the Queen and almost plotsed but she is here today to talk about love, togetherness, family, being a mother, adoption, and the marvel and wonder of the human spirit. She is also an Academy Award and Golden Globe nominated actress and writer of My Big Fat Greek Wedding. She is the writer of Connie and Carla, I Hate Valentine's Day, and co-wrote Larry Crown with Tom Hanks. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome this exotic goddess to its rainmaking time. Welcome to the show. I'm, I'm wiping away the tears. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. 500,000 children are living in foster homes in the United States of America, you say, and of these, 129,000 are legally emancipated, and not all adoption agencies are the same, no matter how they look. I want you to talk about how a person like you who's extremely private made the transition to go public with as much personal information that's heartbreaking, overwhelming, moving, and have so many Dorinis in one book. <laughs> uh, for the listener, a Dorini is, um, that's our, my mom's name is Doreen, and in our family we refer to bits of wisdom that my mom has a never-ending, well, like most moms, my mom would often say things to us like, um, just put some lipstick on and you'll feel better. And I'll be damned if it doesn't work. <laughs> really, put some lipstick on, walk outside, you'll, you will feel better. So I, uh, I, I, I set out to write Instant Mom. It was not going to be called that or anything at all, really. It was just a, a how-to-adopt manual. I went to um, several publishing houses and told them my story and immediately got 10 offers to write the book, and that was really shocking. And my agent and I looked at each other, and she said, you know, it's a compelling story. I told you it is, and, and I think you should go public. And I said, no, no, no. I'm going to write a how-to-adopt manual. That's it. That's all they're getting. I'm not, I'm a very private person. I just, I'll provide context on how we adopted our daughter. She was almost three years old when we met. She was living in a loving home in American foster care, when we met, after 10 years of trying to be a mom, I can't explain how impossibly I knew as we drove toward this meeting that this was it. I knew it. And as we got to a parking lot, she was in a social worker's arm. There were lots of people in the parking lot, and I walked toward this group, this clump of people, and I saw a little brown-haired girl in their arms. And I was looking at her, and of all the people in the parking lot, she turned around and looked at me. Me and all I thought was, oh, I found you. I found you. This this daughter who has been out there saying, you know, there's a there's a reason who has made me realize that there's a reason that all this happened to me. So when I told Harper Collins, I I went with them because they said the magic words that every writer wants to hear, which is, we want you to write the book that you want to write. And I thought, that's it. That's all we ever want to hear, a writer. So I said, thank you, made the deal, went and sat in my office, and I started to write what is in the back of the book now, 25 pages of how to adopt 
that's really all I thought it was going to be, with some extra little anecdotes. But when I got to the part about my daughter and how we transitioned her, I, I realized that she is the bravest person I know. And to not go public with my side of the story would be cowardly and not at all like I, how I like to live my life, even though I say, and I have been an extremely private person, I realized that I had to be honest and admit that the road to parenthood for me was filled with potholes and uh, landmines and not easy. And I wrote this in the same way that I wrote my Big Fat Greek Wedding. Definitely. You could feel that in droves. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't show it to anybody. I just wrote I didn't care about anybody's opinion with both scripts, with the, with the, the manuscript and, and the script. I just knew what was right, and it felt right. And when I finished Instant Mom and called it that because it's an ironic title that I had 14 hours notice before our daughter came to live with us, I suddenly had a three-year-old in our home, um, I didn't show it to anybody until it was printed. I didn't show it to my best friend or my mom or my sisters or my brother or my husband, because I didn't want anyone, not a raised eyebrow or silence or an effusive comment, anything. I didn't want anything to talk me out of being as fearless as I am in the book, because I knew it was the right thing to do. And it's gotten the best reviews I've ever gotten in my life, and they don't matter, which is when you know that you've been artistically pure. You don't care what people think. I'm so inspired by your book, and as I read your book, I was profoundly aware that you were totally authentic. It was clear that you were willing to come all out with the totality of who you are, which is different than a character. There are aspects of you that are part of characters, but we got an interior of you that was very, very robust. Anybody that reads the book is going to be so inspired. And I tell people, since I've read it now three times, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. If you're pregnant, not pregnant, a mom or not a mom, straight or gay, this is such an inspiration. Even the background on how you were told you're not attractive enough to be a leading lady and you're not fat enough to be a character actress. As you prepared My Big Fat Greek Wedding and it got funded and it got produced and grossed over $340 million, you should have made history. It's very, very clear that one of the biggest messages, and I've heard you say this too, is not only never give up, but also that you really can accomplish what you really set out to accomplish. You may not have control over how it happens, which was really the theme of what happened to you, isn't it? Yes, it is. It, it, and I, I actually have tried now to change um, how I'm introduced at all the uh, public speaking events. I'm doing I just say that I'm, I'm not actually an adoption advocate because I, I, I think the, the best thing that someone can do when they write something or when they act or paint something is just, create and not worry about how it's going to be perceived or actually not even think about it. I shouldn't even use the word worry, just not even think about it. What happened with Instant Mom is that the reader is telling me what the book is. Again, like my Big Fat Greek Wedding, I thought with my Big Fat Greek Wedding and everything since that I wrote about something that was specific to me. And then it's surprising to me when this universality comes. With Instant Mom, the reader, the 20-year-old girl who tells me that it's actually a book about screenwriting is no longer surprising to me because I'm real, I've realized that your work is, is how it is absorbed and processed and digested. It, it no longer belongs to you once it comes out of the printer. Yeah, it's like, it's like a baby. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with Nia Vardalis. The Declaration of a National and International Water Crisis is a declaration about water that comes directly from snowmelt and rainfall. It has nothing to do with the water that exists below your feet, underground, into faulted structures all over the world. I want you to know that there is an unlimited supply of available fresh water everywhere on earth, including the deserts. For over 100 years, teams of people have been locating water for private people 
And the reason you haven't heard of it is that it is not part of the mainstream orthodoxy of geology that's taught at universities. When you think about people and animals in developing nations having to walk miles to bring back a bucket of water, I want you to know that that is an unacceptable atrocity. Nobody should have to go through that. I've made a commitment to make water available to sophisticated investors and to people in need across the world and to make commercial applications available for water in the United States and abroad if you listen to It's Rainmaking Time, the segment Water, Water Everywhere, you will hear the nature of why this is so. And when you hear about a water crisis, you will know unequivocally that it is not true. There's only a water crisis as it relates to snowmelt and rainfall, not having to do with the third source of water, which is below our feet. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a sophisticated investor, or a farmer that would be interested in having your own water supply that is independent of the aquifers, feel free to call It's Rainmaking Time. The good news is that there's plenty of water everywhere for anybody and any animal on planet Earth that needs it. Thank you very much. And back to the show. You say that there is nothing done that a lot of love can't undo in the context of the adopting perception. I want to go back to this because I think it's really critical that a lot of people come from that an adopted child is maybe going to be damaged goods or this or that. You definitely blow the perception of that away in the book. In other words, it's finished. Okay. It's what I call poofed. You poofed that one for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so because I wanted to dispel the myth and every single time these morning shows have the rare one adoption that doesn't go well, and they scare everybody away, I wanted to put a positive, and the many positive adoption stories that I cover in the book, out there. And at the same time, I didn't want to sugarcoat it, which is why I'm completely honest in how we transitioned our daughter and how it wasn't easy. And some days it was challenging and difficult and really, I, we wondered if we were the right people to do something like this. In, and then as, as quickly as that, you have that thought, it's gone, because you think, yes, I am. I'm up to this. I am this girl's mom, and I can do this, and she can do this. And we, we I, only, I, I shouldn't even say that Ian and I transitioned our daughter, because we all transitioned together. We became a family instantly, but the next couple of days, months, years, the bond got stronger and stronger. Did you feel that you, in writing your book, actually came out as a more spiritual person than your public persona ever allowed you to presence? Yes, I think so. I, I have a relationship with God that is my own and private and unique, as everyone does. And I always say, same God, different flavor. It doesn't matter who you believe in. The underlying theme of almost every religion, if not all of them, is be good, do good. And so I think that it brought me closer in that I think that you have a plan and God has a plan, and your plan doesn't count. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're totally right. I'm really in my 20s, but I look 54. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, uh, and, and it's very, very clear to me with a lot of things that I've done in my life, there is a plan that I get to be part of, and I don't get to drive it at all. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I believe that I was chosen for this. It feels completely right. Every time I get up and speak about adoption and the journey of personal happiness, which, again, that's what I'm saying. The book, it's not an adoption book. It's not a mom book. It is about your 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 right to be happy at the end of your life are you going to look back and have regrets sure i think that's healthy and it's okay but if your overwhelming whole life is spent uh not doing things because of your your concern of what will people think or it's not done i'm hoping i'm hoping that with these great book signings that I've been able to do and all these people that we're meeting, I'm hoping that we're all going to go forward and be able to be a little more fearless. Because it's kids. Kids say and do 
anything. My daughter pointed at a friend's mole on her face and said, <laughs> why do you have that? <laughs> Well, at least she didn't look at an Afro-American who was helping around the house and say, how did you get that color skin? Like (laughs) some of us did and got into big trouble with our parents. That was a very innocent question. Like, how come your skin is darker than mine? Uh Right? But I really wanted to know. But who knew? You couldn't ask these things years ago, right? I, I don't think that that's a bad thing. I really don't. I think that kids are guileless. And their innocence is, it's just, it's beautiful in a way where they just say things and it just stops all pretense. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with Nia Vardalis. You are tuning in to an advertising space, but it's not like any kind of advertising space. It is called a coherent advertising space. It means that you are plugging into the energetics of this program, this conversation, the consciousness and you want to be part of the magic. You could be an individual that really wants to send this segment all over the world. You just want to do it, and you want to plug in your financing to do it. Or you could be a company that has an advanced product line, a very exotic, unusual product or service that is revolutionary or revelatory that you want to put on the map. And you want to be part of this conversation with Nia Vardalis and myself because it's rainmaking time. If that would interest you, call us at 626-398-8652 and we'll plug you right in and we'll bounce this thing all over the world. And back to the show. When you say we're not grown up, you and Ian, you refer to yourself as not grown up. You said that a few times in the book. Why do you say that, and what do you mean by that? I feel like we are um, immature, and, uh, you know, all the examples I give in the book, since the publication, there are 30 more of just, you know, things that happen, like, you know, somebody cut us off the other night that we were driving the evening, and um, Ian said, Alaria, I'm going to roll down the window, give that guy a dirty look. <laughs> And he did, (laughs) and the guy started laughing. (laughs) Any other ones? (laughs) Um, There's just, there's just always, there's always something. And you know, we have a household where you know, Aria is rewarded if she can get Ian in the ear with a water squirter. That's oh, how fabulous! Oh, that's fabulous. And I, I think that we sort of this this uh, pursuit of, of silliness works for us. But sometimes we have to be really serious. You know, we, Ian and I used to go in for parent-teacher meetings now. We are not good at it. You know, we will we'll make jokes. We'll, you know, steer the topic to something we really care about, like gay marriage. And, ah, it's just, we're, before long, we're, it's, we're just... <laughs> I hear you. You just give them your book. I think it's the best yeah. thing you should do. You yeah. got a lot of kefi, I'll tell you. Got a lot of kefi. Uh, you want to tell the audience what that is? Kefi is a Greek word that is in my life in ruins. I didn't write that script, but I got to add a lot of Greek things to it. And one of them is the pursuit of uh, your inner spirit, your happiness. And uh, I did that because at the time that I was reworking that script, I was in the pursuit of becoming a parent. And I added it because I felt uh, it's inexplicably buoyant as I started to do that film. I had just met with the American foster care workers, and when they told me about the 129,000 kids and assured, that were legally emancipated and available for adoption and assured me that I would be a mother within the year, I absolutely believed them. And I went back to acting. I went back on camera. I, I started to make this movie. I was so happy, and they were not wrong. With, so I came back to the States, and within that year, I became a mom. You say that the best example on manners is to treat everyone with respect and a smile. That is, that is a rarefied statement for somebody in the position that you're in, don't you think? I've seen behavior on movie sets that is intolerable. It's uh, one of the reasons that I don't allow our daughter to see us act. I don't allow her on a movie set because it's a work environment and... Sometimes you will see bad behavior, and that would be very hard for me to explain to her. I, I just, 
I, I work with people who are kind and polite, and sure, there are disagreements. I believe in healthy discussion, discourse, argument, absolutely, but never to take it down to that level where a person is embarrassed or made to feel less than, as if their opinion does not matter. I've seen it on my movie sets, and I stop it immediately, and that's just the way I choose to live my life. We recently had an example two days ago. My daughter and I were walking across a parking lot, and a paparazzi held his camera at mid-waist level and tried to get a picture of her, and she saw it and I saw it. So I turned my body to cover her face, and I said to her, did you see him? And she said, I did. So I walked covering her, and we continued to walk toward where we were going to get frozen yogurt. And then when I saw he had put his camera down and pr- tried to pretend like he wasn't taking a picture of us, I took her hand, still covering her with my body, and we walked up to him. I said, let's go talk to him. <laughs> we walked up to him, and I said, she's a minor. You should be ashamed of yourself. This person is a private citizen. I'm an actor. She is not. You should not be taking pictures of my daughter. And he said, I wasn't taking pictures of you. I don't even know who you are. And her mouth hung open because (laughs) people don't lie in her life. I don't lie to her. Her dad doesn't lie to her. We don't lie. I will tell her the truth even if it's bad news. And she was stunned, just stunned. And she said to him, I saw you. You're lying. (laughs) It was great. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's awesome. Wow. Isn't that great? And he turned beet red. And I said, you just lied to a child. You should be ashamed of yourself. And I took her hand, and we walked away. And then we turned back, and we took a picture of him. And then she stood off to the side, and I leaned in and said to him, if that picture appears anywhere, there's going to be trouble. I love it. That's how it should be, actually. I, I, yeah. I'm for a new law for celebrities. Honestly, even though you're public figures, I, I think there needs to be boundaries like a whole new thing done. It's, it's, it's not okay. It's just not okay yeah. what goes on. It's not okay. Somehow they it's, feel entitled. They feel that, you know, it's their right because, you know, you have notoriety and, or a public figure, so too bad you get to take it. And it's, it's not okay. It's not okay. They're minors. They don't work for a living. If a child is a child actor, that is that parent's choice. It's different, but this is a kid. If your school wants to take a picture of your child, you have to give written permission. I agree. Yeah. You say that there's no such thing as being just a mom. I love that. Talk a little bit about that. That would happen to me when I was in the pursuit of parenthood and the incredible tsunami of my big factory wedding happened to me. So I would be invited to these fantastic industry parties, and I would be speaking with men that I was in business with, and then meet their wives. And so I would say to them, what do you do? And they'd say, oh, I'm just a mom. And that, you know, for me, who was secretly, privately, trying so hard to be a mom, which I thought was the the most important thing that I could do with my life. And again, you know, I say in the book over and over again, it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. But for those people who have been gifted with a child to denigrate themselves was um, was sad. I felt it was sad because as a society, we don't value the people who form our children, moms, dads, teachers, uh, policemen, policewomen, people who do the, the best work are usually paid the least, if anything. So once I became a mom, I became real. First of all, I did it back then. I would say, oh, please don't say just mom. Is this what you want to do? And, you know, I also met female executives who were able to balance both, have kids and careers. So then as I became a mom, I I became so vocal about it. Whenever I would meet people at ballet class or something, and they'd say nice things about my movies, and I'd say, what do you do? And they'd say, I'm just a mom. I'd go, listen, listen. There's no such thing as just a mom. It's a great thing. You're a mom. You're a stay-at-home mom. And they'd look at me and back away slowly because I was a little effervescent, I would say. (laughs) Talk a little bit about the three types of adoptions. There's open, there's closed, and private adoptions and how they're different. And I also thought it was interesting that there are no orphanages in the United States. That was surprising to me. The back of the book, 25 pages of how to adopt all over the world, explains the three types of adoption are domestic, which usually means an infant 
and the birth mother, you are matched with the birth mother. The birth mother chooses you from a profile that you submit. The second type is international, which is self-explanatory. And then the third type is FOS adopt, which is short for adopting from foster care. Then there are two subcategories, open and closed. Open means further contact with the birth family. Closed means no contact with the birth family. Private does not actually mean closed. Private means that you go through a private adoption agency, which means that a lawyer facilitates the meeting between the birth mother and the adopting mother. And then, isn't that interesting? Yeah, and then you can also is. just use an agency. And then usually you'll need a lawyer to finalize, but sometimes not. And I thought it was interesting that in the American foster care system, it doesn't cost anything. That was surprising to me, too. Shocking. American foster does, yeah, they don't. American foster care doesn't discriminate in most states. It does vary state to state, so you should check with your local government. It's really interesting. American foster care will help anyone adopt. Of course, you still have to go through the rigorous background check, fingerprinting, and uh, home study and then classes, which I found extremely helpful. I didn't find that invasive at all. We still use language and things that we learned in those classes now. Our daughter is almost eight, and we still use things that we learned. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Nia Vardalis. It's funny how sometimes you don't take action until people have died. I remember visiting my mother in an Alzheimer's facility in Studio City, And my cousins, Carol and Dan, were there. And I had this little tape recorder with me. My dad had passed on five years before. And I started to interview my cousins, Carol and Dan, about my parents because they were very close to them and they knew them for many years even before they were married. I want you to know that I got the funniest, most adorable stories about my mom and dad that I would have never heard otherwise. I kid you not. I found out that my dad, Buddy Greenhouse, used to invite people to massive parties, bring everybody together, and then they'd all get to the party and they go, where's Buddy? And he was not there. In other words, he would just put the whole thing together, get everybody to come, and sometimes he would not show up. Now, you may not think that's funny. You may think that's rude and all that, but I thought that was hysterical when I first heard about it. It's just not something that I would think that my dad was capable of, but apparently he was. Many of you listening to the show are going to wait until your parents and your sisters and brothers and cousins pass on before you ever capture the wonderful stories and legacy of your family. I'm making a very special service available to those of you that would like me to interview your family and capture the wonderful stories that are the gift of your family legacy. It's a really special service. It's very confidential and private and can be done in either audio or video. Don't miss the occasion to capture the living legacy of your family and the great treasures that are sitting there. I'm a miner. I know how to get to those treasures. Call me at its rainmaking time. Thank you. And back to the show. As we close the show with the last couple of minutes, I just want to ask you about your friend Kathy Greenwald, who's your best friend. When she gave you the advice that giving birth is not what makes you a mom during the trials and tribulations of not being able to get pregnant and the in vitro fertilization not working. Talk to me about that time, what you experienced when she said that to you. I think um, the role of your best friend or any friends in your life is to sometimes give you information that you don't want to hear. And I think what makes a best friendship is telling each other those things. So when I was going through so many difficulties and wondering why, why isn't this happening and, and, you know, confiding in my best friend and my sisters and my mom and saying to Kathy Greenwood, I I don't understand what I should do next. It's not working for me by biological means. And she quietly said, you know, giving birth is not what makes you a mom. Now, I did not take that information to heart right away. It stayed with me. But sometimes you have to hear things 10, 12, 15 times before you're ready to receive the message. I still say it's good that she said it at the time and then several things that she said since because it slowly absorbed and I I turned to adoption as the last option. And why I wanted to write the book and show people how to adopt 
even though, as I keep saying, it's not an adoption book with the last 25 pages, the appendix of how to adopt, is because I entered a world and met people who chose adoption as the first option, who chose to expand their families not uh, out of uh, desperation or uh, as a last resort. These are people that say, oh, yeah, we had a spare bedroom once our kids went to college, and so we, uh, we adopted these five kids. <laughs> Wow. I, I met people who never thought about uh, procreating biologically and turned to adoption as the first option. So for people who might be listening and thinking, yeah, I, I have always wondered about doing it, okay, the last 25 pages of the book are for you. And then for people who are saying, hey, I'm interested in, you know, this fearless idiot that this girl refers to herself as, then the book is for you <laughs> as well. It's not just about being a mom. And why I'm on the show and why I cannot stop talking about it, and I thank you so much for giving me the platform, is because I'm donating the proceeds of the book to get kids adopted from all over the world. It makes me feel useful, and it gives me a purpose to the voice that you've given me, like going to my first movie ten times <laughs> and uh, telling all your friends about it. Thank you. <laughs> also, uh, this is my way. <laughs> you say that you're tenacious, assertive, and obstinate, but I have to tell you, in my book, you're led by the heart, you're kind, and you're soulful, and you're pure delight. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you very much. It's rain-making Thank time. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I want to thank Demetrius Katis. For the Spirit of Athens opening of the show today, Kristen Jameson for planting the seed, Andrew Abong for being a brilliant creative minister, a digital god, (laughs) a sound editor, and somebody I couldn't do the show without. And Bruce Barker, who started its rainmaking time with me and is a fabulous producer, also an incredible creative minister, and somebody who this show could also not be happening without. He is a master at his craft. I also want to thank the book Instant Mom for being the inspiration that it is. All of you go to your bookstores and pick up the book by Nia Vardalos. Thank you so much. It's rainmaking time.